that your spirit would come and give us a glimpse, a greater glimpse of who you are. And Lord, we pray that you would come too and give us a greater glimpse of who you want us to be as your people. Amen. We're going to start by singing the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Uh, you will recognise most of it, but there's another verse in there that you might not know, but it's a brilliant verse that just talks about God being our treasure and him delighting in us. Um, we don't have a, a full-blown music team today, worship group, to lead us, but we've got used to the fact that actually we can worship the Lord with video. So that's what we're going to do. So if you'd like to stand, please do. We're going to start with Great is Thy Faithfulness.
us. He's given us an everlasting peace. We're thankful for that. Let's thank him together. Of the goodness of God 
Your name is great and your heart is kind. Thank you for your greatness, Lord. Thank you for your kindness to each of us. Amen. We're going to focus this morning on God's greatness and his kindness in creation and what he calls us to do in response to that. So a little bit of a different take and I've no idea whether when Gavin thought about having a creation care service, I've no idea whether what's about to happen is anything like he thought it was going to be or not, but no doubt he can watch, listen and find out and perhaps he'll return to some of these themes again. You might have seen this on your social media feed, these, this wave picture, uh, particularly last year. I don't know if we could see that, Kevin. Thank you. You might have seen that at some point um, if you're a social media type person. Um, that, that picture was going round a lot, um, particularly last year, that actually threatening to engulf the whole human race was COVID. And as people were dealing with that, threatening to come on the back of COVID was an even greater danger to the whole human race as people perceived it. Um, and that was the recession. That picture has now been replaced by this one. <laughs> that actually COVID was a huge thing and we know that across the world uh, there were, you know, there were and there are so many deaths that recession then comes and that causes great um, unrest. But actually an even bigger catastrophe coming to the human race is climate change um, and Justin Welby this week had to apologise for his comments at the COP26 um, conference in Glasgow where he likened the climate change emergency to a worse catastrophe than the Holocaust and he apologised to the Jewish community for making that comparison but actually he was making the point that actually if we don't, as a human race, do something about the climate emergency that we're facing, the damage will be far greater than COVID, will be far greater than the Holocaust, will be the biggest thing that has ever happened negatively to the human race. There is this further picture um, along the same lines, but for now, uh, biodiversity collapsing and war, but for now we'll just focus on the climate emergency. What does the Bible have to say about all of that? And is there something distinctively Christian that we can bring to the table? Um, I was just talking to uh, Josie as, as she was walking in and she said, oh yes, we've been thinking about this at school. Um, it's good, isn't it, to think about something that's so much in the, in the, on the front pages, so much on the, on the news headlines from God's point of view. So we know that God really loves his creation. We know that he saw that it was good and that he delights in everything that he makes. He delights in you. He delights in the mountains. He delights in all of creation that he's made. And we see, don't we, in creation working well, an amazing blueprint of everything working in harmony with everything else. And if you just begin to think about how creation works, that, you know, we depend on the bees for what they do in order for us to thrive. And if you change something in an environment, then it has cause, uh, consequences and consequences and, and you end up having everybody in the ecosystem not working so well. It's beautifully balanced and wonderfully made. And in scripture, the goodness of God is often described in a good creation. So verses like Isaiah 44, when God talks about pouring out his spirit, what analogy does he use? He uses a creation one. I'll pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. That's God's picture of pouring out his spirit. He uses that creation analogy. When God talks about human beings who are in relationship with him and thriving in relationship with him, Jeremiah wrote this, those human beings will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green, 
It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So God uses beautiful, positive creation language to describe beautiful, positive relationship with us. And Jesus tells us, doesn't he, that we can sum up the whole of God's commands by loving God and loving our neighbour. And one of the ways in which we love God is to love what he's created. Um, what would it be like if I had made something beautiful and you trashed it? I would feel affronted, I would feel dismayed, I would feel that by trashing what I'd made, you were somehow you know, negative towards me. We can honour God by loving his creation. And, and in scripture as well, even obedience is linked to God's beautiful creation. These are some words from Deuteronomy, talking to the people about to cross into the promised land. The land you're crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It's a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. So if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your hearts and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine and olive oil. I'll provide grass in the fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. So linked to our obedience is God's replenishing of creation. It's all... It's all mixed up in God's mind. Plato separated mind and body and spirit and soul, but that's not really a biblical thing. Um, God wants to save us, but he's going to give us new bodies, isn't he? He didn't create us to be just some spirit being. He created us to be a physical being. And we know that he's going to give us new bodies because the physical, the created, the things we can touch are important to God. And if we separate the two, then we're not thinking about things as he does. So as a Christian, if you want to be holy, we need to be holy in the things we think. We need to be holy, we need to be sexually pure, we need to be uh, holy in the things we speak, but we also need to be holy in the way we care for God's creation and not drop litter, because that's trashing the beautiful things that God has made. And throughout scripture, God celebrates his creation. We're going to read together some words from Psalm 104, and it's just a celebration of how amazing God's creation is and how it all works so beautifully together. The whole of creation praises God. We've got some people lined up ready to help us read, and perhaps together we'll read the bits that are in green. Perhaps we can have the words on the screen. Let's read the bits in green together and other people will read the rest for us. My soul, praise the Lord. Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with glory and honour. You wear light like a robe. You built the earth on its foundations so it can never be moved. Lord, you cause water to flow from springs into the streams that flow down between the mountains. The streams provide water for all the wild animals. Even the wild donkeys come there to drink. Wild birds come to live by the pools. They sing in the branches of nearby trees. You send rain down on the mountains. The earth gets everything it needs from what you have made. You make the grass grow to feed the animals. You provide plants for the crops we grow, the plants that give us food from the earth. The sun always knows when to set. You made darkness to be the night, the time when wild animals come out and roam around. Lambs roar as they attack, as if they are asking God for the food he gives them. When the sun rises, they leave and go back to their dens to rest. Then people go out to do their work and they walk until evening. Lord, 
created so many things. With your wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of the living things you made. Look at the ocean, so big and wide. It's filled with all kinds of sea life. There are creatures large and small, too many to count. Lord, all living things depend on you. You give them food at the right time. You give it and they eat it. They are filled with good food from your open hands. When you turn away from them, they become frightened. When you take away their breath, they die and their bodies return to the dust. But when you send out your life-giving breath, things come alive and the world is like new again. May the Lord's glory continue forever. May the Lord enjoy what he made. My soul, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. May the Lord enjoy what he made. We've got to not trash it if God's going to enjoy what he's made. And we know, don't we, that God put us, human beings, as people to take care of everything that he'd made. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So we as the human race have been given that job to rule over creation, but having been created in the image of God and God's rule is kind, God's rule is generous, God's rule is to make the people he's ruling over thrive. So if we're going to rule over creation in the image of God, we're going to do it well. We're going to do it not for our benefit, but to make creation thrive. That's the mandate that God gave to the human race. Not that our rules should be oppressive, not that our rules should be taking from creation, but that our rules should be caring for creation, just as God's rule over us is to care for us. We're only here to do that as stewards of what God's given us. And as he gives us that role, we need to do it in his way. But the human race has pretty much messed that up, haven't they? Um, if human beings had never fallen, then they'd have been able to be guided by God in every way that they worked the fields, in every way that they used the land, in every way that they treated the animals. But actually, that's not true. Um, we wouldn't have been trading slaves, we wouldn't have been uh, deforestizing the planet, we wouldn't have been exploiting the ground, we wouldn't have been um, overfishing, we wouldn't have been doing all those things if we'd been caring for the world in the image of God, in the way that God cares for us. But actually we know that, you know, we have, we've messed that up, we've done it wrong. God built into creation, didn't he, that concept of Sabbath, where even the land had a year where it wasn't used. Can you imagine our, our society shutting down the factories that produce things for a whole year just to let creation have a rest, just to let there be a year's worth of no pollution from the factory chimneys. Can you imagine our society doing that and trusting God to provide? But that's what Sabbath was in the Old Testament, that the Israelites would trust God to provide for them and let the land have a break, let the land have a rest. But that's so far from what the human race does at the moment. And another biblical principle that we see is that we shouldn't make any shortcuts with creation. You might have read those uh, 
slightly strange verses in the Old Testament where you're not supposed to uh, plant two kinds of seed in the ground and you're not supposed to mate two different kinds of animals. And you might have thought, those are weird Leviticus laws, nothing to do with me in the 21st century. But actually, the reason in those days why somebody might have planted two types of seed or might have mated two different sorts of animals was to get a bigger and better one. Supposing you wanted an animal that would work harder for you but consume less food or water. Well, let's mate one that works really hard with one that doesn't need to consume much food or water and see if we can get a better one than God's created that will work better for us. That would have been the motivation for his people to do the mating, for instance, of two or three different kinds of animals, trying to get bigger and better. We as a human race have meddled quite a lot with God's creation and we don't know the consequences of that but actually what God has created is enough isn't it it's good enough he created it and he just asked us to look after it for him but instead of supporting him instead of tending his creation for him we've actually as a human race brought all of it into a bad relationship with us, with the rest of creation and with him. So we're a source of cursing to creation and not a blessing, which is so the opposite from what God calls us to be. And our destructiveness has messed up the harmony of God's beautiful creation. And our plundering of the world's resources has put lives at risk, human life, plant life, created life, animal life, and we've damaged creation when we should have been actually looking after it in the way God intended us to do. We're just gonna watch a little clip of a little girl who's telling the story of how the actions of human beings that she doesn't know have actually affected her life. My name's Salote, I'm seven today. My home is an island a long way away and people in plains come for miles to see our beaches and sunshine and sparkly sea. The island was nicer when Nana was young. She's lived here forever with Daddy and Mum. When I was a little girl, Nana complains, we knew when the fields and the seasons would change. The ocean was busy with colourful fish. We'd play on the beaches whenever we wished. Daddy's a tour guide, but he isn't here. He's out on his tour boat for most of the year. The visitors don't want to look at the reef and lots of the fishes have fallen asleep. The water is hotter, the coral is white. There isn't much left where the fish used to hide. Daddy said Earth's like a very big house where people are only as big as a mouse. But people like fires, and make lots of smoke and play with the taps until everything's soaked. They run through the rooms like there's nobody else and raid all the cupboards to keep for themselves. Mummy's a farmer, but she's feeling sad. The wind started shouting, the water got mad. They ran up the beach and pushed open the door. They turned off the lights and left mud on the floor. I don't understand why they made such a fuss. Why is the weather so angry at us? There's salt in the fields now, and less of the grain, and mummy lost all of her crops in the rain. We can't go to market or cook them for tea, so mummy leaves most of her dinner to me. School isn't open for now, mummy said. She wants me to help in the field instead. Nana's been coughing, she walks with a stick. The weather's so angry, it's making her sick. The road to the hospital broke in the night, so she stays in bed, she says she's all right. I wish I could study and look for the cure, but I don't have time for my books anymore. Nan's a believer, she talks about God. She told me a story about a big flood. She says, God is bigger than all of the waves, but we should look after the world he has made. It's not just a playground, all pretty to view. 
our brothers and sisters rely on it too. That's the trouble, isn't it? That what we do affects disproportionately those people in the world who are poorest and most vulnerable. And it's an issue of justice in the end, isn't it? That we might pray for little girls like that one. We might give to projects that help little girls like that one. But if at the same time, we are not doing something about the climate emergency and the things that we're responsible for, then that's a really mixed message and only part of the solution. Micah wrote these words. What does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? And as I said, Jesus says you can sum up all of the commands in loving God loving what he's created, but also loving our neighbour. And the world's shrunk, hasn't it? We've got global neighbours like that little girl. Um, and to love them means that we'll, we will be careful about what we do in response to this climate emergency. But it's also hard, isn't it? It's also hard to really work out what little me can do that's going to make any difference. Jesus said, didn't he, that we should deny ourselves and take up our cross, and that's part of being a disciple. And some of the things that perhaps we have to do um, will be denying ourselves. They will be maybe consuming less. They will be maybe doing life a little bit more awkwardly for the sake of um, people like that girl that we've just seen. But there is a climate emergency and God has called us to care for his planet. I remember when Gavin and I first started talking about today, um, I sat in his office and we, we'd had a conversation and then we were praying about what we were going to do. Um, and I remember praying, Lord, I'm not really into this. I'm not really very passionate about this. You need to get me more excited and more passionate about this before the 7th of November. Otherwise, it's going to be really tricky. And um, I have to admit, I stand here as someone who has become more passionate about it as I've thought about some of the things that we've seen today. And I've realised a lot more than I ever had before as I've had to stop and think about it a bit. And hopefully you will too, that actually it's as much part of being a disciple of Jesus that we should care for his planet, that we should care for those that he loves as anything else. Paul wrote these words, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but looking to the interests of others. Others including those people who are at the moment the most affected by the climate emergency. Our actions need to be putting them above ourselves. My actions need to be putting them above myself. Our actions as a church need to be putting their interests above our interests. And that might mean denying ourselves, whether that's denying ourselves a flight, um, we really want to fly somewhere, whether that's de not denying ourselves a food product, whether that's denying ourselves a, a hugely um, fossil fuel consumption consuming gadget, fire, vehicle, whatever. Maybe there'll be some aspect of denying, but that's what Jesus calls us to do, to deny ourselves and pick up our cross. But we are doing some good stuff. It's not all doom and gloom. Christians are doing some good stuff. Um, and um, you might have seen on the news um, 
lots of stuff about um, divesting um, investment and stuff from fossil fuels. So companies trying to work out how they can be more ethical, organisations deciding that they're going to withdraw their investment from fossil fuel companies who are trashing the planet and actually invest more ethically. And, and the church has been at the head of that. The church hasn't done it perfectly, but it's been at the head of that. And organisations like Tear Fund and other faith-based organisations are saying now that climate, the climate emergency is the biggest cause of poverty and urging us to sort that out so that we can sort out the poverty issues as well. And young people are taking a lead. You might have... Um, seen on the news Greta Thunberg. I can remember the children, they're not children, the teenagers in my class at school having successive Fridays off so they could go and go school strike to uh, campaign for climate change. Greta, when she started, is a couple of months older than Josie is now. So Josie, be inspired by her. She is now um, leading the young people of the world in doing something about this climate emergency. And she was only 14 when she started it. Um, and you might have seen on the news thousands of people uh, protesting and marching and all of that in Glasgow, but lots of those demonstrations have been by young people saying it's, it's our future and we need to do something about it. This little video clip is um, made by a group of young people that Tear Fund have got together. It's their response to the climate emergency. We are moved by faith. We hear God's call to creation care and see a world that's been neglected, a world that's on fire. And if we, the church, don't care enough to put it out, who will? We are in a climate emergency. Extreme weather conditions are destroying people's livelihoods. Natural disasters are leaving many without a place to call home. And people's lives are being lost. Those who contributed to this problem the least are suffering the most. We don't just care because it may one day affect us. We care because it's already affecting thousands around the world. And soon, we will pass a point of no return. If we sit back and do nothing, many more lives will be lost. To do nothing is to turn our backs to our God-given duty. It is up to us as those who are called to love our neighbor to do just that. How can we claim to love God if we do not care about his creation? How can we claim to love others when we are burning down their house? We, the church, must love in action and not just word. We must hear the cries of a world in peril and use our platform to respond with the love of Jesus. A love that disrupts the status quo and inconveniences itself to bring restoration. This is our responsibility. This is our worship. That young person is quite clear that it's part of her worship to do the things that will save the planet. It's part of her worship to speak up for those people who can't speak up for themselves. It's part of her worship to live in a way <coughs> that honours God, honours his creation and is loving towards the people that he's made. We know that one day God cares about creation so much that one day he is going to recreate, isn't he? He is going to renew and recreate the whole of creation. He's not going to get rid of it for a just spiritual environment. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and he's going to give you and me a new body because God cares about creation. And now Jesus, the son of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, is holding the whole thing together. 
and he is going to, he did on the cross, and he will do completely in the future, reconcile, Colossians says, all things to himself. So there is going to be a renewed, restored creation that God's going to bring about. But in the meantime, he's called us to be part of what's going on now. Those verses that we often quote in Chronicles about uh, what happens when people pray, um, the verse says, doesn't it, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Do something restorative in creation if people pray. That's a good thing. We can take hold of that. We can be the people who humble ourselves and pray that God will heal his land. Because he doesn't just talk about forgiving, he talks about healing the land. What can we do? That's the big thing. I hope you've got the idea that actually God calls us to do something, to step up and do something in this climate emergency. What can we do? Have a look at this. Um, really, it's about your carbon footprint. Some of you will know all about that and be measuring it constantly and all of that kind of thing. Um, some of you might already be trying to reduce your carbon footprint. Some of you might have paid to offset your carbon footprint in different ways. Some of you might be going, I've got no idea what you're talking about, Jill. <laughs> um, this next little graphic just explains something of what's going on in all of our lives. The average UK carbon footprint is 8.1 tonnes per person per year. So that's the amount <coughs> of carbon dioxide we release into the atmosphere as a result of being us. And um, people tell us that in order to deal with this climate emergency, we should be aiming for that to be about two tonnes. So that's a lot more than it should be. Um, each of those Lego bricks there represents about half a tonne of bad stuff that we should be trying to reduce. So if you fly frequently, creation's had a bit of a rest during COVID, hasn't it, from flying. If you fly frequently, that has an effect. In your home, that has an effect. Um, the electricity you use, all of that kind of thing has an effect. The driving that we do has an effect. The kind of car we have, the way we drive, whatever, has an effect. Interestingly, the biggest thing there is our diet, what we eat, the amount of meat we eat, where the food comes from, all of those kind of things, that has a huge effect. Um, the yellow bricks are kind of the everything else. <laughs> and, and the grey bricks are things like hospitals, schools, the government services, society structures. All of those things contribute in a negative way to the climate. And our job as people who've been entrusted by God to care for his creation is to reduce that in some way. So um, Ruth Valero is a theologian and a climate activist. She uh, works with Tear Fund and she's got this to say about her own journey in coming to terms with needing to do something about this whole thing. When we look at our world today, we all know that it is facing massive problems and environmental degradation is this huge issue that faces us. Climate change in particular, but then all of the things that go with climate change and the things that, that we know are going on in our world. And it can be easy for us to be like rabbits caught in the headlights. We know there's this massive problem and we know as Christians that it's something that that we should be responding to and doing something about and yet how on earth can little old me respond to something so huge as climate change with all of the big problems that it's bringing with it. The thing that really 
got me engaged with environmental issues from a Christian perspective was when I was at university and I was studying theology and someone lent me a little book called Whose Earth, which was very simple and it just went through where in the Bible caring for the earth featured. So once I had seen where it featured biblically and how much a part of the biblical narrative was this idea of looking after the world, then that was what clicked in it for me. And I realized as part of my Christian faith, this was something that I needed to take seriously. When I look in the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about the situation that we're in today, I see very clearly that God made this world and he loves it and that he's created us to look after it and that it's gone wrong because of us. And that's a message that we can't shy away from, that the problems that we see in our world are our own doing. But the good news is that Jesus calls us to join with him in bringing about the restoration of all things. Over the years, as I've thought about these things and tried to live in ways that look after this world of God's, there have been a number of different things that we have done. The food we eat, reducing the amount of meat is the most significant thing we could do there. The way we travel, um, dare I hit a, a holy sacred cow, our flying habits are really causing a lot of damage. And again, as followers of Jesus, I think flying less is one way by which we can worship him really practically. The energy we use, thinking about where our energy comes from. One thing we can do there is to switch our energy to a green energy supplier. Really easy thing to do, doesn't need to cost much, but actually doesn't need to cost much more than the energy supplier we are with, but will make a big difference. And then thinking about the things that we throw away and taking active steps to reduce the amount of waste. There are two things I think looking back that have been challenging for me and for us as a family. One of those things has been meat eating. We were hardened meat eaters as a family and it took, it took quite some time and quite some persuasion for us to, to move away from that. And I think the only way to do it is little by little. So we started off having one day a week when we wouldn't eat meat. And then when that felt normal and we'd got used to some meat free recipes, then we went to two days a week and then to three days a week. So I now don't think anything of the fact that we don't eat much meat. That just seems quite normal to me. And the other thing for me that that we've had to wrestle with has been family holidays. We took decisions not to fly on holiday and that led to that that made us think of other ways by which we could have holidays. And actually looking back as a family, I know that it's led to us being much more creative and we have had some wonderful family holidays. So it's been good, but it's been a challenge as well. I always think in terms of little steps. In fact, my motto is many little steps in the right direction. And sometimes it's just too much to think of doing a great big leap over there. But one big leap is made up of lots of little steps. So I would encourage you, don't worry about all the things that you can't do. Just think about the things that you can do. And maybe as a result of your discussions, take one thing that you can do, just make one decision. And when that has become a normal part of your life, then think again and choose something else and do that. So we can sometimes get tied up in knots, worrying about the things that we can and can't do. And I'd say, don't worry about that. Do what you can do and always push yourself to do a little bit more. That's really practical advice, isn't it? We can't do the whole thing, but we could each do one little thing. One of the churches locally to us that has really taken this on board um, and is trying to uh, work out how they as a church, as individuals and as the church together can take these kind of things forward is Epps the Methodist Church um, and they have a whole, a whole display. They are an eco church and we would love somebody in our congregation to 
be the person who championed for us getting us to that stage where we became an eco-church. That involves how we do things together and how we do things as individuals. A few decades ago, maybe, the kind of mark of excellence was to be a fair trade church or a fair trade organisation, wasn't it? That was a while ago. That hasn't stopped the climate emergency. We need to do more than that, good though that is, if we're to halt the climate emergency. So here is a little leaflet that I've put together with the help of um, Tear Fund and Epsom Methodist Church. It's called 12 Ways You Can Slow Down Climate Change. So take this on your way out, or if you're listening on Zoom, I will email it to you and just do what Ruth said. See if there's one of those things that you could do. Get used to doing that until it becomes normal. Maybe do another one. Maybe you'll read some of these and think, actually, yes, I'm doing some of those already. Well, that's, that's a good thing, but it's a practical challenge. It's part of our discipleship. You can look on the internet, you can look everywhere to find out what we need to do to make a difference but the fact is that we should be wanting to make a difference because that's what God calls us to do. Back at the beginning we read that Psalm 104 which was the psalmist's response to creation. We're going to listen to another psalm if you like, a modern day psalm the psalms in the Bible were often set to music. I wonder if you ever wonder what the tunes were. Well, this is a modern day psalm set to music um, as somebody's response, the writer's response to what they see as the climate emergency. So we're going to um, listen to this psalm. It's from a, a, a CD called not Doxology in praise of God, but Doxicology. Um, in praise of God's creation and what we need to do to be good stewards of it. So we're going to listen to this psalm and as you listen to it, perhaps you might begin to think yourself about your own response and then we're going to finish our service with a couple of songs of worship.
No more greed or war, no more tooth and claw, for the wolf and the lamb will be friends. Have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, forgive our broken ways, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, renew the world you made. Have mercy, Lord, have mercy. mercy Lord have mercy Lord renew the world you made O Lord my God when I in awesome wonder Consider all the works thy hand has made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Your power throughout the universe displays Sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great.
Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you
none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Lord, we pray that you would show us more of who you are as the creator and the sustainer of this planet. And we pray, Lord, that you would fill us with more of your heart for the creation that you have entrusted to us. And Lord, we pray that you would lead us out in your love to those around us and to those the other side of the world who are our neighbours that we might love the Lord our God with all our hearts and with all our souls and all our mind and all our strength and we might also love our neighbours <coughs> as ourselves and live in a way that shows that love. Lord, these are huge things that we've thought about today but I pray that you'd help us to respond in a way that is our worship to you as that young person on that video said. Make us worshippers, Lord, not just in, in songs on a Sunday morning, but in the way we live, in your world. Because we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.